Hi, good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Justin. I'm from the Internal Displacement Monitoring Center in Geneva, Switzerland. And I'd just like to thank IGMAR and the QCRI team and UNDP for inviting us to participate in this workshop. Uh, we're really excited to be here. Um, so I'm going to tell you today about just two techniques that we're using uh, AI to help us address some of the challenges that we face at IDMC. Don't worry, this is the, my most text intensive slide. Uh, everything else is a lot prettier than this. But um, I just wanted to make sure that everyone kind of is on the same page and understands what is internal displacement before I start talking about internal displacement. So here you see the definition of internal displacement from what's called the Guiding Principles on Internal Displacement, which is uh, sort of the UN soft law uh, on this issue. Um, but there are kind of three key dimensions to it that I've highlighted at the bottom. One um, is that internal displacement is an involuntary movement. Um, and secondly, um, as, as the name suggests, it's within the borders of a given country. So these are people who are fleeing but remain within their own country. And the third dimension, which is key to know, and I'll come back on this later, is that the displacement can happen uh, both ex ante or uh, ex post. So you can have a preemptive fleeing, like an evacuation uh, in advance of a disaster, or who, people who flee before an attack occurs, or of course it can happen once an attack has occurred, once a disaster has struck. So, as a few colleagues have mentioned already, uh, there were over 68 million uh, people displaced at the end of 2017. Uh, both UNHCR and IDMC were crunching the numbers and we'll be coming out with our reports with the 2018 figures in just a couple of months. But at the end of 2017, uh, there were over 68 million uh, people displaced and over 40 million of whom were displaced within their own country. So internal displacement represents an actual bigger challenge in a sense uh, than uh, refugee flows. Um, and it represents yet an, an even bigger challenge in the sense that unlike uh, refugees who have a UN uh, agency to look after them in international pro legal protection, uh, people who are displaced within their own countries um, face additional challenges because they don't have this kind of international framework. Uh, it's up to the governments of their, of their home country to protect them. And, and one thing that you would, you'll notice immediately about this map is that we've only got one color on here, which is our, our, our orange, which is what we use for conflict displacements. So there are actually even more than 40 million uh, IDPs as at the end of 2017, um, but we didn't. We don't actually know how many people were displaced by disasters at that moment in time. Um, but we will have that figure um, in our for our 2018 figures when we publish those um, in May. Uh, so we'll have two colors on this map: the, the global total number of people displaced by disasters, by country, and by conflict. Um, and as you can see, uh, internal displacement is a phenomenon that affects um, nearly every country in the world. Uh, my team in Geneva, um, we're monitoring uh, internal displacement in 253 countries and territories. Um, our colleagues who have spoke already have talked about uh, the size of their teams and how small they are. We're even smaller, um, a lot smaller. Um, so at IDMC, uh, in, in, the, in my team, we have only eight people monitoring all of that displacement globally. Um, that is a massive, massive challenge and represents a, a really big uh, resource constraint. Um, and, and, and basically, we use artificial intelligence and a bunch of different kind of quote unquote innovative approaches um, to address some of the problems that we have. Um, and I think it's really critical to mention just a couple of things first. Um, one is that we don't quote unquote do innovation. We just have a lot of problems and we just try to solve those problems and how we do that however we can. And we generally do that by not coming up with the solution ourselves, but trying to find out where has a kind of an analogous solution been uh, deployed successfully somewhere else, and then how can we adapt it to our own use cases. Um, so one of the major challenges that we face is capturing all incidents of internal displacement around the world. Um, we captured displacement uh, data for, one, for more than 1,800 disasters last year. Um, and even more uh, incidents of conflict and violence. Um, that's a lot for eight people to, to, to work on. Um, one of the other challenges we face 
uh, is covering all phenomena. Um, it's really difficult to capture displacement uh, related to slow onset uh, ha natural hazards because it's, it's hard to identify where is that T0 moment around which people may have become displaced. So this is a big issue for us with regard to both droughts, uh, the impacts of climate change, as well as um, generalized violence and gang violence in some countries um, such as the um, Honduras, Guatemala, El Salvador. Another major challenge that we face is capturing the duration of displacement. If you don't know when the displacement started, it's very difficult to, to estimate how long someone has become displaced. And then a fourth challenge is measuring the severity of displacement. Um, what we'd like to be able to do is paint a sort of a multi-dimensional portrait of any given situation of displacement at any moment in time. So you can think on one axis is the magnitude, another axis is the uh, severity, and then track that as both or track both as they evolve over time. Time. And then, as I mentioned, the fourth is our, is our human resource constraints. Um, and what you see here, just on the on the right, is that you know we have around the world internal displacement is, is happening almost every day uh, in some places, um, but we only get reported information on a fraction of that. Um, and then we can only verify you know a subset of that, and that's that's what, it, what ends up getting reported in our in our figures. So I'm just going to tell you about two solutions. Like I said, we do more than this, but these are kind of two really concrete hands-on ones that I can illustrate um, kind of fairly clearly and simply. The first is just about working smarter. So like I said, we have eight people trying to capture, um, you know, uh, trying to try 40 million plus IDPs every day around the world in three dimensions. So the first thing that we did was we Kind of, kind of totally revised our, our workflow process. It used to be when we, when I was started at IDMC, that we would actively look for information. So you can imagine the capacity of about eight people googling for information around the world and surfing the web, trying to get data on internal displacement. It's it's suboptimal to to put it one way. So what we tried to do, what we did instead, was we 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 revamped it from like an active search to more of a passive data collection system using something called natural language processing and supervised machine learning. And this here on the right is kind of a, a little bit of a schematic of the workflow. So we trained uh, some computer algorithms to basically um, mine all the world's news and stuff, and then uh, filter it, classify it, and then begin extracting uh, key bits of relevant data um, from from the from the text that that uh, was deemed uh, likely to be relevant. So some of those key features include um, what kind of what was the cause of displacement? Was it a disaster? Was it conflict? Was it something else? Where did it occur? How many people were displaced? What's the reporting term? What's the reporting unit? Are we talking individuals, families, etc.? Um, but then um, there, we we don't remove the humans. Um, this, the, you know, the machines are, are only so good, and our, our algorithms are, are, you know, are pretty good. They're about 84. They were at the, at the start. They were about 84 percent accurate in terms of uh, precision. Um, but we need the uh, human supervision to to train it and to validate what's coming out of it. Um, so here, let me see if this works. Yeah. Okay. So what we do is. First, um, we just uh, visualize the output of, of this of this stuff uh, on this map. So here, I just took a slice, um, and you can see what's being reported. And as I mentioned, for eight people, this is just really too much to track uh, on, on a daily basis. So this is just sort of the first screen, and um, this is what they look at every morning. And then they kind of zoom in uh, using some of the features on this platform to to you know to cover the the countries that they monitor, and then they sort of dive into the data. So what does that look like? So so this is what we used to get. We would sort of come across, like whether it's an article or a report, it's totally unstructured data. You have to read it. You have to then begin extracting and, and, and making sense out of it. Um, and then what our, our algorithm does is it transforms that into this. So it recognizes that you know, these are locations. It recognizes that this was the reporting term here. And it, and it captures that this was the a quantity. This was the number of people displaced. So this is able to to help my team, you know, really Im massively uh, speed up the work that they're doing. It doesn't, of course, replace them, but it just uh, helps them work in a much much more efficient manner. So just to wrap up on that one example. Sorry about the formatting here. Uh, Ingmar asked us to, to kind of address these three questions. So what can we offer to others? First, anyone who wants to get access to this platform, this is, this is oh, it's totally open source. Um, so if you're interested in uh, uh, you know, having access to this, just 
uh, let me know afterward, and I can tell you how to how to get access to it. Um, secondly, um, it's it's totally customizable. So we are we've we've kind of parameterized it for around our use case, which was about uh, internal displacement and also refugee flows. I forgot to mention that we kind of as a as a favored UNHCR, we we also trained it to, to identify anything about uh, cross border flows as well. Um, but the, but the approach is totally generic. So if you, if your use case is is about water or or, or some sanitation or epidemiology, um, we can just adjust the the keywords and the NLP uh, algorithms to to train it to look for for other stuff as well. Um, what do we need from others? Um, right now, we're only working in English. Um, we're about to add French and Spanish, um, but we don't have Arabic. And if you think about where internal displacement's happening around the world, um, it's not only happening in Anglophone countries or even just in Francophone countries. So we really need to work with partners to add uh, additional languages to it. Um, we also need to work with partners to really improve the, the geolocation component of it. That's actually the kind of the biggest weakness of our, of our program at the moment. Um, and then lastly, how we work with others. Um, so right now we have, we have pretty strong data sharing agreements um, where either we incorporate and ingest information from or share data back to um, with a number of partners. So one is the Armed Conflict Location Events Database, ACLED, uh, OHCHR, IOM, and then a bunch of operational part partners like NRC. And then one, one example, that I really should have mentioned, and I only realized on the plane after I sent my slides to Ingmar yesterday, was actually how we built that tool in the first place. So when we started out, um, we began by thinking, okay, there's a tool that's existed in the public health sector now for many years called Health Map, and it uses kind of a similar approach. Um, and, and we said, okay, we want to use something similar and do something similar for internal displacement. So let's do it. So um, I have one data scientist on my team, and he and I kind of work planned it, and we realized it would take us about three years since neither one of us was you know, trained in NLP. Um, and we thought, okay, it's going to cost us about 300000 over three years, and eventually maybe we'll get there. And then both of us went home that night and thought, that, that's kind of a crappy plan. Um, we're both impatient guys, and in three years, who knows where we're Believe there will still be at IDMC. So we came back and said, let's, let's have a chat about that. And then we said, oh, wait a minute. Maybe we, can, maybe we can do this a different way. Maybe we don't need to come up with a solution and, and deploy the technology. Maybe we can just um, find a better way to do it. So what if we, we said, what if we, what if we weren't IDMC, uh, this stodgy NGO in Geneva? What if we were like a, a startup somewhere in some other country? Um, we would do it totally differently. Um, we would just do a contest. So that's what we did. We partnered with uh, the UN uh, and their data science platform called Unite Ideas. And within three weeks, we launched uh, a global challenge, um, a contest, uh, to come up with what I just showed you. And within four months, they built, uh, or the, the winning uh, entry, uh, winning team, I should say, um, which is from a, a, an association called Data for Democracy. They built what uh, my data scientist, Leonardo, and I were going to do in, in three plus years, and they did it in three, four months. Um, so that was one, for us, really interesting and, and, and kind of fun way to work with partners. Um, so second solution, uh, it's, we, we're using basically machine learning plus a couple of other things, to enhance our, our impact models. Um, so as I mentioned, um, we, we track uh, disaster-related displacement um, primarily in, in over 200 countries in the world, and we've got a, a probabilistic disaster uh, displacement risk model, um, which if anyone has ever worked in the insurance industry, you know that prob probabilistic risk is, is your bread and butter. Um, and we adapted the, a global disaster risk model from uh, the UN International, uh, op, the UN Office for Disaster Risk Reduction, UNISDR, um, which is where I used to work. And we took their model and we basically tweaked it. Um, the, the original model, and, and like the insurance industry models, what they're measuring are economic losses. Um, so in the insurance industry, what they're measuring is you know, uh, economic losses or expected economic losses for their policyholders. What the UN and the World Bank have done is they've taken that same approach and extended it to the entire economy. 
And then we said, okay, let's take their data sets and their general approach and see if we can use this to estimate the risk of internal displacement uh, caused by disasters. So you have kind of three terms in the model. You've got a hazard component, which is what we run probabilistically. And then we have an exposure layer, a vulnerability layer, or vulnerability functions. And then we use the, the combination of the three to, to estimate the, the expected displacement uh, within a given grid cell or a given uh, administrative geographical unit uh, over a given period of time. So that's great. That's really useful for informing uh, disaster risk reduction potentially or climate change adaptation policies, but it's, it's not kind of fully exploiting what one can do with it. So what we're doing now is we're combining the risk model uh, and we're running it rather than probabilistically, we're, we're using it deterministically. So what we do here is we take basically real-time hazard data from uh, global Earth observation systems. Um, this could be either uh, information about forecast hazards, like a flood forecast or a cyclone track, or it could be observational data, like an earthquake footprint that's just occurred. Then we run that, so rather than running it probabilistically, we just take the footprint for that hazard, we run it through our model, then my team here does their usual thing and they, they, they go out and they get the data or we receive the data from our partners and we validate it. And that feeds back into uh, both primarily the vulnerability parameter of our, of our model um, to, to improve its accuracy. Um, but it's, it's not just that, because we also work with uh, UNOSAT and uh, um, the JRC, uh, the European Commission's uh, Joint Research Center, uh, Copernicus Project, and, and others using some other techniques. Um, so we kind of feed, feed the information back, back to these partners um, to basically get better estimates. Um, and then we also work with um, Facebook and some of our partners use uh, mobile phone data, and we also ingest that. So we try to kind of come up with a, a more uh, triangulated and, and sort of a validated, uh, better validated estimates. But eventually we can, we can feed this back and, and actually provide services. So right now, if we have um, basically uh, a projected displacement with a, with a forecast hazard, we can provide that information back to, um, to support hazard early warning systems or disaster early warning systems so that uh, evacuations can be undertaken in a more sort of strategic um, and precise manner so that the right number of people are evacuated from the, from the right locations. But it can also be done, it can also be extended further by letting people know when it's safe to return to their home, for example. So by combining um, you know, additional data from some of our partners, we can, we can basically indicate when, when, it's basically, when, you're, when your neighbors have returned, when, it's, when your home is, is basically safe again. So just to wrap up on this one, what can we offer to others? So again, access to our platform. If you're interested in having any of this forecast displacement information, um, again, just let me know and we can give you uh, access. Um, we're going to extend it, uh, we can also extend our same impact modeling to not just output uh, displacement, but if you're interested in uh, school damage and destruction, uh, we can, we also, have, that's part of our data set. I just chose not to display it, but that's, that's also in the, in the base layer. Um, so if you're wondering about that, that's, that's there too. Um, another thing that we're doing, we're extending this, this approach to is to estimate the risk of conflict-related displacement and develop a conflict displacement early warning system using an event-oriented uh, method. Methodology. Um, there are a bunch of ethical dimensions to that, which is partly why we haven't yet started it. Um, what do we need from others for this uh, project? Well, we definitely need more ground truthing. Um, this this uh, this approach uh, is is capturing you know many events uh, every single day all around the world, and eight people uh, can't alone validate it. So we need to work with partners. Um, and then we can also use more updated uh, and granular uh, exposure data. So right now we have about 100 square meter resolution uh, at global coverage, but um, but some some in some places um, you know local communities have even better uh, resolution. You know in the U.S. they've got uh, exposure data on a cadastral on a building by building basis. You can plug that in instead and get a, a better output. Um, and how do we work with uh, partners and others? So right now at the moment, we're just, uh, one of our main sort of partners is the Pacific Disaster Center, um, which is actually, a, they have a bad name because they're, they, they, have, they have global coverage. But we're feeding all of the outputs of that, of that model into their, uh, into their platform um, because they work with governments and, and disaster management authorities uh, to, to coordinate disaster responses. So that's just one, one example of, of where this is going. But it also goes to HDX, um, that's OCHA's platform, um, and we share this information as well with IOM. So that's it for me. Uh, thanks very much. Appreciate it.